Good evening, good evening, good evening, and welcome. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the really, truly enormous privilege of serving as president of Hunter College, where the American dream continues to come true just as it has for the 153 years since our founding. That's worth a round of applause, right? <laughs> it's a great pleasure tonight to welcome you to Roosevelt House for this important and original discussion, the first in a series of Hunter College events to mark and celebrate Black History Month. It was in this house that Eleanor Roosevelt began a long friendship with the educator Mary McLeod Bethune, which blossomed when Dr. Bethune became the unofficial head of the so-called black cabinet that went on to advise and sometimes lobby and appropriately pressure, pressure President Roosevelt to advance the struggles for civil rights and women's rights with Eleanor's constant prodding. And there are pictures of this house of Eleanor visiting uh, with Mary Bethune that are quite touching. The house has always been an incubator for conversation and understanding. We're enormously proud and pleased that it is still playing that role 80 years after the Roosevelt's first transferred the building to Hunter College. We're also aware that once again, this moment in history demands our attention. Black History Month started yesterday under a sustained cloud of tragedy. The recent beating death of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, Tennessee, we at Hunter regard it as crucial to gather and talk and in the wake of brutality to commit to this community, to our opportunity, and to our humanity. I want to acknowledge um, first that many of our faculty from film and media, I'm so happy to see the co-sponsor of tonight's event, our Department of Africana and Puerto Rican Latino Studies under the visionary leadership of Dr. Anthony Brown. We were one of the first countries, colleges in the country uh, in 1969 at the peak of the civil rights movement to establish a department of black studies. It is a department now of black and Puerto Rican studies which continues to contribute scholarship, education, and advocacy. We are so pleased tonight to present this conversation that not only brings together two of Hunter College's finest faculty, but one that promises to remind us and to reconnect us to the core values on which Hunter College was founded in 1870. There was the intrepid Irishman, Thomas Hunter. He founded the normal school for women that would one day become Hunter College. It was with a bold and progressive vision that he had for students of all races or religions, countries of origin, and any and all economic means to share the chance to learn side by side, ensuring equal access to opportunity, prosperity, and success. Of course, that was for women at that time, and then decades later, open to men. And so it is with that history in mind that we welcome tonight's extraordinary guests, two powerhouse women, educators, writers, and media stars, as they explore a subject for our age, the rise of black women as powerhouse achievers and influencers in modern culture. Charity Elder is, we're very proud to say, an adjunct professor at Hunter College, and thank you, uh, Kelly, for bringing um, her to, having us here at Hunter and having her be part of our wonderful part, Department of Film and Media, which includes our journalism program, and, and to Cecil McCarthy, who's a leader in that department. C Charity guides students who seek to make a difference through their writing and reporting. With more than 20 years of experience in broadcast and digital newsrooms, including a stint as a producer at NBC News and CBS News, Charity brings to the classroom an invaluable wealth of experience and knowledge, not just in media, but in politics too. After serving as an advisor to Mike Bloomberg's 2020 presidential campaign, she became the head of a video podcast for Yahoo News, dramatically improving the reach, scope, and quality of their newsmaking content. Her honors and recognition include a profile in the New York City media television series, The Vanguard, Women in Media, and a place on Folio Magazine's prestigious list of top women in media. Charity, we could not be more pleased to gather tonight to celebrate the publication of your first book, congratulations, Power, The Rise of Black Women in America, How Black Women Embody the American Dream, Defy Oppression, and Win. In this groundbreaking and page-turning account, Charity not only illuminates the way black women in America have ascended to the heights of success across a multitude of industries, but how they overcame the challenges of oppression and discrimination to do so. The book utilizes a multidisciplinary approach that weaves together history, sociology, and a fresh analysis of both existing data and new data. 
enlivened by interviews and stories from social media, pop culture, and charity's own personal experience, power sheds, sheds a bright, new, and overdue light on the way black women relate to, aspire to, and indeed expect success. What charity arrives at in conclusion is as certain as it is profound. There has never been, she says, a better time for black women in America. To discuss the book with her, I'm so pleased to welcome back to Roosevelt House a very special friend and colleague. The extraordinary Karen Hunter is a distinguished lecturer in the film and media department who has long been a part of advancing Hunter's goals of education, excellence, and inclusion. She has many writings, including in our 150th anniversary history collection, The History of Black Women at Hunter College. She is also a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and currently the host of the hit Sirius XM radio show that bears her name. In addition to teaching courses at Hunter ranging from basic reporting to intro to publishing to radio and serving at Roosevelt House as a Grove leader, she's a prolific and successful author in her own right. Her best-selling books include the collaborations with icon of powerful black women such as Queen Latifah with whom she wrote Ladies First, Revelations of a Strong Woman. Karen is a former sports and news reporter who wrote for 12 years for the Daily News, where she also served on the editorial board and won that Pulitzer Prize and made history as the paper's first African-American female news columnist. I'm especially pleased to introduce Karen to this in-person gathering after she's helped us get through COVID with a series of, of Zoom discussions during the pandemic called Speaking of Justice, in which we dealt with race, racism, and reform. I want to take the opportunity to express our, all of our deep gratitude to Karen for her leadership and in guidance in organizing those important conversations which, which brought our community together in a very difficult and challenging time. Much like the spirit of Speaking of Justice series, this event that brings us together here tonight provides an essential part of Hunter's ongoing commitment to recognizing, dismantling, and transcending systemic racism. In doing so, the discussion you are about to hear or become part of helps us also to fulfill our historic obligation in our motto, Mihi Cora Futuri, the care of the future is mine. With that powerful logo motto, we ask you to join in in thinking about our commitment to the future, to our students, to our community. And nobody embodies that commitment more than our host, Karen Hunter, and our wonderful faculty member, Charity Elder, here to talk about this important new work about black women in America. Please welcome Karen Hunter and Charity Elder. Hello, hello, okay. First of all, thank you for that amazing uh, introduction to um, what I think is an important conversation that um, we don't have enough. We talk at each other in this country, and not with each other, and I hope tonight uh, we can spark some deep conversations among ourselves. Um, want to just a special thank you to Mrs. Elder, who is here tonight, Charity's mom, uh, who I got to meet, just since we're talking about powerful black women. Come on now. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and all of the powerful women in, in this room. Um, I want to start off, first of all, should we hold this book up? Because the cover is beautiful, by the way. Yes. Talk I, about talk about the inspiration the of this cover. Yeah. So the the cover I actually um, came across this image, which is beautiful. Looked really hard for it. Actually, it wasn't easy to find, and it was created by um, a woman who is a um, Nigerian American. She lived for some time in uh, Canada and now resides in France, in Paris, with her family, her two daughters and her family. And during uh, COVID, she already did graphic design. She felt inspired to create this image, and she calls it good hair. <laughs> and it's just a beautiful celebration. I mentioned all the places that Carol um, has lived because there's an international kind of global feel to, to the cover. And for me, that was representative of the diaspora, right? In terms of the story of um, the North Atlantic slave trade and the spreading of black folks all over, all over the country um, and all over the world rather. And so it also represented that for me too. I call that the seeding. 
Mm. See, you know, you never know where the seeds are going to land or what they're going to birth, but we are all here as a result of an unexpected, uh, powerful move. You, you open up talking about this is the best time to be a black woman in America. So that was 2016 where you came to this revel revelation of this is the best time to be a black woman. Do you still feel that way today? It's a really good question uh, because I think in the day to day, it's, it's easy to not feel that way. And I can certainly uh, empathize with people who don't feel the same way that I do. But I, you know, I, I came to that revelation or realization um, in conversation with, um, you know, with the white middle-aged man who's a former editor of Newsweek. I described the story um, in the book. And he had a very negative feeling about what was happening in the United States at the time, primarily because Trump had just won the presidency. We all know the type of election he ran. And, but something he said prompted me to say, this is the best time in America to be a black woman, mainly because I understand that regardless of the state of the nation, who I am, um, I understand who I am, and that's paramount. And also, when hasn't there been, except for Obama, a white man maybe grew up racist or had racist tendencies or learned differently or came to a different place, you know, wasn't the president of the United States. So in, from my point of view, what was, what was, that dif what was so different in that regard? But what is the best time? You know, what what do you define as being like a, this is the best time to be a black woman? Like based on what, like what what is happening with us that is making it the best time ever? Yeah, there's a lot happening with black women, and and one of the things that was very important to me in writing this book is that it wasn't just about uh, myself and my five best friends who have done well. You know, it wasn't. You know, I was very interested in making sure it wasn't just a narrative-based story. Not that that isn't important, because it absolutely is your own story. But what was really key for me was being able to um, settle my argument or to see if I could prove out my argument using data. So that's why I say that. And so for me, power, the rise of black women in America, is not a, uh, a hopeful aspiration or, or something that you know, I think we're aspiring to. I believe that I proved it. <laughs> yes, no, there's a lot of data, a lot of facts in, in this book uh, that lay out exactly what you're saying. I'm wrestling though right now with what is power, mm. you know, and can you have power in a world, uh, President Rabb just talked about, Tyree Nichols and uh, his beating that led to his subsequent death, followed by, you know, following George Floyd, Breonna Taylor. I mean, it's like it's been a constant drumbeat for as long as I can remember. And I can remember back to Eleanor Bumpers. That's how far back I, and I'm sure before Eleanor Bumpers, there were cases mm -hmm. that we didn't know about, right? Yeah. So, you know, when does that end? You know, black women started Black Lives Matter and yet we're still having these vigils and funerals and frustrations and pain and trauma. Well, you're the reason I wrote the book. <laughs> because that very sentiment is what I was concerned about. It isn't so much, look, I will, I will say this. I'm, I, the book is based in reality. I'm not making up a utopia that doesn't exist, or that I have lived a life immune from uh, systemic oppression and all the ways that you can think of it, right? I've lived this life in the United States as a black woman. And so I come at this from a very realistic perspective. But what I'm saying is that things can look so bleak that we don't understand what we've done that I show in the data. And the knowledge of that is what can help us continue to turn things around. I mean, I mention Harriet Tubman a lot. 
Because That's the last chapter. It is, yes. yes, because I love Harriet Tubman, and um, she helped me get through graduate school. I would say if I could not, if I couldn't write this paper, because um, I was tired of school by that point, I said, well, Harriet Tubman went back and forth. There is just no way. I'm not going to get this done. And so for me, Harriet Tubman represents um, the agency when there isn't a reason to believe you have agency. And so if she was like her brothers who initially went with her on that, you know, that first um, trek to the north, uh, where she eventually, you know, walked into Pennsylvania and, and you know, secured her freedom, um, her brother, two of her brothers were on, with her on that walk and, and, or that journey, and they turned around because they were afraid. Now, I mean, so when you put this into context, you have a woman who was raised a slave, was severely um, abused, you know, would have these fainting spells because of a rock or something that hit her, um, that was thrown at her from um, her enslaver. And so why did she have the belief that she could do something different and then keep going forward. Um, I, it's, it's that that I want to make sure doesn't die. OK. Before I get into, because there's some stuff I want to talk about. OK. Give us some good news from the stats and the data that can make everyone feel like, OK, I'm it's happy. not that bad. Uh, okay. Just give, give us, no. Give so us I haven't some. convinced you yet? No, I'm still, no, okay. I'm still okay. sitting in this That's uh, all right. time to start over from scratch. You cannot. To yeah. me. Well, but see, but that's where, but see, I think that's where maybe you're missing me. Okay. Yeah, because what I'm saying is first you have to recognize you have the power and that you are able to exercise agency at like the worst possible times and in the worst possible conditions. And so then once you realize you have that power and what you were able to do, what black women were able to do, is then what do you do about making every, make sure everybody else is free? It's not, so if remaking the thing is how you see it, okay, fine. I mean, I, my book doesn't set out to answer how we, no. how we get there. What it does is to say we can do we it. We have the power, yes. Yes. So I'm saying give us, give us give some us of those, some happy. those, mo those okay. moments. <laughs> so, uh, so there were two key sets of data. Um, the first uh, was a poll that I did in concert with uh, the Marist poll. And so we set out to uh, do a representative national study, so it was in, across the whole nation, but we talked to more black folks and black women to make sure it was representative. And that is the piece that happens, but not very often, in terms of making sure that there are these representative national studies done. And so we asked black women a variety of questions, but in terms of the happy, um, we, you know, we asked them about their feelings about success and if they have the power to achieve what they want to achieve. And, um, and black women believe that they do. Most of them do. So over 70% in all of those measures um, that we asked, black women are hopeful in that regard, right? They weren't, you know, it wasn't 50% or 40%. It was over 70% in each of the markers that I just, uh, that I just named. So that was the first seeing that what I felt when the gentleman at that work event, um, you know, prompted me to say, this is the best time in America to be a black woman, it, it, uh, it made me realize I wasn't the only one. Because th there's something in there that, that other black women feel too. The, the second key piece of data, and I do cite other studies and data, but the uh, second most important piece of data that I looked at was um, 80 years of data from the United States Census. Now, because I'm a journalist and I am not a statistician, any of that, I, I partnered with people to make sure the data was good. And so first, I partnered with the University of Minnesota, and they tabulated and gathered all the data. Um, and then I worked with um, Connie Cicero, which is a woman who is a senior scholar in statistics. 
And what they helped me do, what I was interested in doing, I should say this primarily, and, and I, I won't get too long into it because of course it's in the book that I'd love for you to read. Um, <laughs> so I won't get into all of it, but I will share that my primary concern was centering black women because the way that social science and uh, media, the way that we look and study groups of people is that we always look at it and compare it to white people, particularly white men. So white men are the standard. So we're never looked at, you know, my life is very different from a white man's. And so to me, that doesn't make sense. And so I wanted to, to look at the US Census data from the viewpoint that just looked at black women. So over the 80 year period from 1940 to 2019, ages 25 to 64, I looked at black women. And I used three measures that my sociology uh, professor, I called him, because I was a sociology major, and undergrad, and I was like, what should I use as measures? And so we chatted about it. And, and you know, the three that social scientists use to see how a group is doing, one is income, the other is, um, you know, how much uh, education you have, particularly how many years of college you completed, and also um, your employment. So have you grown in terms of your professional managerial um, you know, status? And so when I looked at black women, you know, just the group over time, I mean, the graph is like this, right? Um, it became even more exciting when I compared that to, um, to white men. Um, and I should say that because I went so far back to 1940, I really could only do white men, white woman, black men, black woman, not because that's what I wanted, but because that's how uh, the United States Census was conducted in terms of how they described groups. And so it was just the cleanest way for me to do that. And for white men, everything was negative. You know, or I shouldn't say negative, let me rephrase that. Everything was a much slower rise, that's more accurate, in terms of the rate of growth. And black women was much faster. And um, I can give a brief example. Sure. Okay, so um, it's a lot to explain, which is all you have to read the book, no, I'll stop saying that. No, but, um, <laughs> let me say it, I got it. But um, it, just one example, so when you look at income, so the story you always hear, right, is that white men, um, you know, they earn more money than everyone else. And so for white women, or for women in general, they make 83 cents to the dollar, about, that white men earn, right? For black women, if you take us out and, and separate us, it's about 63, 64% to every dollar that a white man earns. When you look at it the way that I did as groups, over an 80 year period, ages 25 to 64, accounting for inflation, you find a very different picture. And what you find is, is that black, what, I'm gonna do white men first. White men's rate of growth from 1940 to 2019 was 300% in terms of the increase in income. Black women from 1940 to 2019, their rate of increase was 1,000%. And so you may say, well, we were starting from a lower number, right? Like, that makes sense to say. But the, the thing to me is like, you know, in analyzing and thinking about the data, is that when you look across history, so there were recessions and depressions and wars and um, all of these things happening, but black women stayed, the rate was so much faster. And that paradigm, um, is exhibited, or that comparison between white women and white men, you see it in all the areas that I looked at. Aside from all of the data in the book, mm -hmm. uh, in this book, and it's power of the rise of black women in America, I just, I just keep pointing that out. <laughs> How do we come together? All right, one of my biggest struggles every day is, is kind of assessing, as I'm reading your book, as you have a chapter on black men and black women, white women and black women, which I want to spend some time on today, a lot. Um, even in saying, you know, spelling this out, I feel like we're here, we got an insurrection because people feel like your progress is their oppression. 
right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're supposed to be doing better than we are. All of these people are coming into this country and they're doing so much better. And that has created a whole lot of, um, you know, strife. And not that it created the strife, let me rephrase that. It has awakened in people this, this notion that somehow I'm not doing well, so therefore the whole thing must burn down. And we have to deal with that. I'm not saying we, we have to acknowledge it, but how do, how do you propose we deal with that? With people who want to burn it all down. And are you referring to uh, black people or are you referring to white no. people or, or everybody? I feel Just like we're, we're in this space right now where there's a lot of friction in this country around this notion that somehow, and the studies are showing it, birth rates, you know, success. The thing that you pointed out is actually in real time. We're seeing it. Mm -hmm. And there's no context to it. Like you give a lot of context and you, you, you shade it in. But in this country, it's a feeling, right? We operate on emotions, not on data, unfortunately. We, we vote based on how we feel, not based on whether this, this person can actually lead this country. So we still have to navigate this, all of us, not just black women. What do, what do you see as a solution? Or how, how do you, should we even acknowledge it? Just keep our heads down and keep pushing? So I believe that it takes a multifaceted approach and that different people have, have different callings, if you will, in terms of where they want to take it up, uh, this issue. For me, my way of tackling it is to encourage black women to keep going and to keep using, those, keep using their ideas and ingenuity. And I'm not saying that black women are perfect, or that we get everything right. In fact, I'm saying we're human and we make mistakes and we're vulnerable and we need to rest and all of that. I'm saying, you know, we're very human, but what I am saying is that I feel that um, we haven't been completely unleashed from ourselves. Even if we may understand, you know, that we're kind of dope, you know, there's still just the understanding of the reality of what's happening, um, what's happening in the world. And so, and then there are other people like you who are taking up that conversation around how do we address those things. I think it's super complicated. And I don't think that I have the answer for how you do that. But what I am saying is the answer is not to put your head down. The answer isn't to say um, we have to build our own little community. Because in some ways, some of what I, I, I espouse is similar to um, black liberation or like some of those ideas, except for I am not saying we have to have our own. What I'm saying is engage and change and understand that it will continue to be hard. Because if we don't, we regress. Right. So um, when I got to the chapter on white women, I, I, I sat in it for a minute because you, <laughs> you said, um, we don't trust you, white women. Basically, I think you said that, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, she said the inside part out loud. Um, <laughs> And I was pleased because um, every day uh, that I teach, I tell my students, the world needs you to show up as your full self, which requires something of you because we've been conditioned since little to make people comfortable. Even the changing of names, people come here, they change their name to Joe because it's too hard to pronounce as if, mm -hmm. you know, um, we can't put syllables together. We know phonics, right? We can do that, but it's lazy and, it's, and, and it erases people's culture and who they are. And we've done it for so long that when people do show up, it's a threat. It's scary mm -hmm. when they show up as a, because I don't understand that, so it must be wrong. So when you said that, I know that there's a lot of people who are shocked because they think they have good friends and they don't realize that they're in relationships that people don't trust them. Mm -hmm. How do you have that conversation with someone? How do you have that conversation with someone who considers themselves as an ally? So. That is a tough question for me because um, I did not consider white women in the book. Meaning I, yes. my entire framework, how I thought about it, what I was, who I was writing for and why, I never once thought about how, and in that chapter, how a white woman would see it or what they needed to do about it. It really wasn't my concern. Um, and so it, it sounds, it, it may sound a certain way. However, I don't know. You know, the one thing I can say is just treat me like a person. 
Mm, but what does that mean? That so, means like a way, that means like a human. But that doesn't. People don't understand what that means because if, yeah. if that were if that were the case, then we wouldn't have so many instances yeah. where people were treated yeah. inhumanely and they, the microaggressions, can I touch your hair, or the little things that are said about complexions and the little things that are said, mm -hmm. they don't mean, you know, you're not really, you know, qualified, you know, and and that those things that we keep silent about, right? So I'm glad, so first let me thank you for saying it, because I thank you for centering black women, thank you because publishing uh, usually Books are written, whether we're talking about Ibram Kendi's anti-racist, they're not written for black people. Those books, those wonderful, amazing books with those amazing authors, they're out there talking to white people. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not doing that, and you're unapologetic in it, so I wanna say thank you, because it's a conversation that needs to be had, because we code switch and fold ourselves into tiny versions of ourselves to make other people comfortable, because sometimes our full selves is just too much. <laughs> But that's what I think is so great, our full selves. I just, um, I said treat me like a, like a human, you know, uh, accepting me of my flaws and the things that I'm good at and that I could be quirky and funny, um, whatever it is that that humanness is. And the rest of it, you know, I really believe in the context of white woman and black woman, um, that white women have to figure it out. That it, that it is, it's not even necessarily my job. That's not the part that I'm contending with because people have been saying that for a while. It's not my job to whatever. It's more of I'm not taking the resources from myself to do that. I'm gonna take the energy I would put into that and put it towards you know, change or creating a life that's meaningful and of joy. Like, you know, because the point is, we are at a time in history. This is not 150 years ago. It's not, it's not good. There are things still happening, but it's not. And um, and so, yeah. Do I do I have to kowtow to that? No. Um, I have, and, and it's funny to say this because when other people say it, you know, we get offended. But um, I absolutely have white friends and mentors. And when I went to church, you know, growing up. In, we went to a church that was predominantly white. And like my, you know, one of my first friends I remember had curly red hair. So it, it's, you know, an individual level. There, there's a woman that I speak to in the book um, and we talked about this. On an individual level, you can't have relationships. It's impossible to say that that's not possible on an individual level and not have real relationships. That's impossible. But what I'm talking about uh, is white women as a, a system. Right. And so the... I, I also asked, I should say this, in the Marist poll, I asked black women, do they trust white women? Do they trust Latino women? And do they trust Asian women? Um, I really wanted to just get at the white woman, but when we did the pilot, we realized that, you know, it's hard to put that because you have uh, sisters-in-laws and, I mean, you know, we're all a part of the family. And, and really, so four out of 10, black woman said they do not trust white women. You know, five out of 10 did, so the majority did, right? A little over five out of 10 did. But four out of 10 is a lot. I think that's a lot. And I believe that that distrust comes from a feeling of betrayal. And I write about um, how, you know, when you really think about it, you go back to the colonial days and 1619, we all know that number now. Um, when the first Africans who were enslaved came came to the U.S., um, you know, black women and white women were in it together in the sense that white women were also subjugated. And so there's a feeling of that, A, you know what it feels like, so that's A. B, every single time in terms of history, in terms of major movements in history from suffrage to all the different waves of feminism, what are we on now, like the fourth, the fifth, all the different ways of feminism to all of the white women who voted for uh, Trump. I know the number isn't 53 anymore, but a lot of them did and helped him get into, uh, it Twice. is, right? It is that where there's a sense of betrayal. It's what happened with the Women's March in 2017. 
and let's go back to suffrage. You know, I keep going to Ida B. Wells, mm -hmm. uh, who named her daughter after herself and keep her, kept her maiden name, which just makes me so happy that she <laughs> and was like, yes, I am Ida. Yeah. Yes, yes, I am. Um, she was on the front line of getting the vote, but couldn't march with the white women. Mm -hmm. When it came, they were like, no, uh, you're black. You can't march. But, but aren't we all in this? So that betrayal it's beyond the plantation oh, where, yeah. you know, it, it just continues. And, and Trump's election was one more. You're like, mm -hmm. are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. 54, maybe 53, 54 yeah. percent. I don't know what the so number it's, is. So it's like that little... It's not little, but it's that like that center, that like that rub, that makes it very difficult, um, and and that you don't forget. And then I found, um, which I, I use this in the book, but I found an op-ed that Toni Morrison wrote in 1970, and it's titled "Why Black Women um, Don't Trust Women's Lib," is you know how she spoke about it, and. She goes in. I mean, she says, black women do not trust white women. This is not a new idea. It's, it's essentially what you're saying is, I said the quiet part out loud, because I feel like, why not? So how do we transfer this to media? Uh, of course, Ms. Elder. Power the rise of black women in America. <laughs> Everyone should get the book. Um, as a journalist, I was just telling my students this today. When I started in the 80s, 4% of the newsroom was black. Today, 4% of the newsroom is black. And I said, the, the problem is not just the problem with that, is that there are people in the newsroom who are there to get ahead, of course, and they're gonna please their editors, right? So even your blackness doesn't matter if you're operating under the system. The police, that's a system. So that five black men beat up one black man, it's about the system, it's not about the complexion. We get caught up and hung up on race when it's really about the power system that we should be addressing. So if the newsroom is not more diverse, and it's not about adding new numbers, it's about really understanding what diversity is. It's not complexion, it's ideology, it's the way people are brought up, it's culture, it's all of those things. If we can't get that, and Hunter's a great representation of it. Let me just say, I was in my classroom today and I was like, yeah. two kids from Peru, from different parts of Peru, yeah. kids from Asia, kids uh, from Harlem, Africa. I mean, it's like, and we can have a conversation about race. Come on. Yeah. Yeah, that is full because everyone's coming to the table. So who watched the video? Why did you, did you care? And one kid was like, well, it doesn't really apply to me. And I'm like, this is Vegas. Say what you need to say. But it, it allowed for conversations that they, they are not having because we're in these boxes. White, black, women, men, you know, mm -hmm. here, there, you're, you're not your full self. So how do we penetrate the, the, the newsroom, which needs to have conversations like this in, in their op-eds, in their journalism, asking questions of people who never get questions asked of, how do we penetrate? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I had, uh, I was fortunate to have a, you know, a great career in, in journalism, um, and I still think of myself as a journalist, uh, but it, it doesn't mean I didn't have my share of, you know, run-ins, you know, with this kind of thing, or um, I remember once um, saying to a senior producer, oh, there's this, you know, this black girl who's missing in Maryland. This is like, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago, missing in Maryland. And I remember, and that was during the time of Natalie Holloway and Lacey Peterson, and like we were on a roll, right, with all those um, stories. And I remember my senior producer said, oh, no one's gonna relate to that story. And she, you know, I, I, I remember that she wasn't from like, you know, two-parent home. It was, it was like a dicey story, but that was why it, so it wasn't just race, it was also socioeconomic, it was all sorts of things, uh, you know, that was at play. I mean, you know, I really believe the only way to, to make a difference with that, see, like, here's, I'm going to take a step back, because it isn't so much just the newsroom, it's about how we think about DEI in general. And a lot of it, I believe, is performative. I also believe a lot of it is so people can tell, um, so your senior e, you know, VP can tell 
the CEO, the CEO can tell the board, we held this meeting, we did this thing. Like, it, it has nothing Check to do, it, yeah. yeah, it has nothing to do with actual um, real change because I think if it was about actual real change, you wouldn't ask a black person to do extra work during that time. That's how I see it. Hello, and we should all have off during Black History Month. Like, yeah, like why not, right? Uh, Juneteenth, white people should work. Why? <laughs> Why are y'all taking off on Juneteenth? Like, for real. Why is Juneteenth a national holiday? I, anyway, that's a whole other. Well, it, it, that makes sense to me in the context of, you know, the black experience historically has been about labor and, and free labor. And so that's why that. Yeah, but it, right? then white people should work. That's what I'm saying. What I, I agree mean. with I agree with you in terms of taking that taking that time off. I, I absolutely agree. So, you know, when it comes to the newsroom, yeah, we're in all of these boxes um, because the box was created in order to make money. You know, enslavement economy, right? And so then that essentially is how we have the Western, uh, you know, global north that we have today. It all come, it all stems from that, I believe, my, my analysis of it, from, you know, the slave trade and to make money, they created the box. And so those boxes exist. Right. That's part. That's part of the reason. And so, the only way to, um, you know, my thought is the only way to change, to kind of change that, is that you have to see yourself in a different way. You have to think differently. You have to be different because then you behave differently. It's it's the reason why I can say, uh, black women don't trust white women. Now, most black women you ask will agree with you, right? right. Um, and and there, there is history and context and reasons and reasons for that. But it also is because um, I believe in my right to speak. Yes, and tell the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Or else we're not free, right? Exactly. Or else we're still in a form of bondage. The thing that I really thought was cool, what, we're gonna take questions? Okay, I love it. Listen, because I'm, I'm greedy. You know, we, we're going to be up here. I'm, I'm going to have you on my show, too, because we got to talk to charity. we got to talk to charity. Because um, uh, I, I did want to get into black men and black women, because uh, that's very personal to me, and it's, and it's also something I'm struggling with how to talk about it. And it feels like, you know, in the wake of Kevin Samuels and his acolytes and all the other problematic people, and they are all problematic, there's this, this wedge happening while black women, you know, and the black women's success seems to almost foment the same thing that I'm talking about with the, the white backlash of, oh my goodness, everyone's succeeding and why, you know, like Florence uh, from the Jeffersons, how did everyone overcome and no one told me? That's how white men are feeling right now. That said, you know, just briefly, what, um, I'm asking for a friend, how should, <laughs> How, how should we navigate these spaces? Because at some point, again, diminishing yourself so someone else can feel dominant and strong and powerful and all of these things is not the solution and it's not gonna happen. Being alone is also not a really good solution, I think. I don't know, maybe it is, I don't know. But <laughs> what are your thoughts? Well, I haven't met Mr. Wright yet, so perhaps that's part of, part of the deal. I, I actually, you know, I think it's because I've been concerned and busy with other things. Sure. Not That's so what we much. tell ourselves. Yeah, no, I'm no, I'm serious. Okay. All yeah, right. no, I'm serious because I'm ready now. But um, but yeah, I've I, I get very focused on things. It's just the way my brain works. So that that actually is true. At least for me, it it, it is true. Um, uh, but I, I will say in terms of navigating, and I'll try to say this quickly, you know, people would treat you how you let them treat you. And so for me, it's just, you know, the standard is here, which means that A, uh, the conditions in this country are not worse for black men than they are for black women. That should go away. Uh, that idea, the idea that it's my job to make you look good in public. Mm. That's not my job. The idea that um, you know, I have to help you succeed at the expense of myself. I don't believe that. I'm going to let that go. And, and so the thing is, is, it's pretty much, that's just where I am with it. And I remember being, um, 
uh, in Ohio before I wrote the book. Oh, I was on my way to start writing the book. And so I was talking with a group of people. And I remember um, there was someone about my age, so in his 40s. And he said, well, aren't you talking? Because I just said it's about black women and their power, something very general, because I hadn't started writing yet. And, and he said, well, what about black men? And I'm like, you write well, the book. Who, yeah, right. like what, what does that have to do with what I'm saying? Like what I'm saying is what I want to say. I'm not coming from any other perspective. And, and so to me that is central. And, I, and, I, and, and I'll say this one sentence, maybe it's two sentences, but I'll say this really quick. Um, patriarchy in the black community is real and it is extremely disappointing considering what we have been through. And I don't believe that we will ever really reach where we need to be as black people if black men keep relying on a system of oppression um, that is patriarchy. Come on, I read a quote today, yes, give that up, um, that black men are, yes, we, you can, sir, you, you keep your ma mask up. Um, <laughs> I read a quote uh, that said that black men are black women's white men. And I was like, ouch, ah, please let that not be so, but I know it is. All right, in, in too yeah. many cases. And it's not because I don't love black men. No, I mean, I love my father, yes. my uncles, my cousins. It, it has nothing it's, to do it's with systems, that. systems, not individuals. So exactly. let's not get in our feelings. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, so uh, he obviously doesn't need a mic because <laughs> his, his voice carries, okay, so. Keep it pithy, no monologues, no soliloquies. Uh, <laughs> ask your questions, please. Okay, oh, he's gonna stand oh. up. All right, this is gonna be interesting. All right, let's go. Are you, sir, sir, state your name, where are you from? I can hear you through your mask. I, that's okay, just go ahead. Okay. Hi. Yes. Hi, oh no. I'm Michael Myers, president of the New York Civil Rights Coalition. My question Jesus. is a very specific one to you. When you say that we don't, and I'm calling you, trust white women, you're in the house of Eleanor Roosevelt. You're against history of Lillian Smith, white women who were individuals who stood up for racial justice and equality. And I can name so many of them, but Karen won't let me. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're just right, the you're example right. of Eleanor Roosevelt, okay. it's insulting to say. Okay. It's insulting to say that people cannot accept people as individuals, that, have to, that people have to be characterized and stereotyped by either their race or their gender. And it's time for us, meaning everybody, not just black people, it's time for everybody to stop in the racial stereotype game. Okay, thank you, Michael. So, thank you. Um, I think you did say. Yeah, not I mean, I I said very clearly more than once that it's about systems and not about individuals. So that's that's the first thing, and the second thing is I live in reality. So yes, I am not going to get away from encountering <laughs> someone like being in Eleanor Roosevelt's house. I mean, that to me, it they're not um, in conflict or in tension. Maybe for you it is, but I feel no tension you know, between that because I have relationships with white women, but I also see white women when they do crazy stuff. It, and, and I'm saying when I see it. So that may be hard for you to hear. I, I can appreciate that. But, but, I am, but, I have, but I was really clear that I, that I was talking about systems and not individuals. Right, because race is actually a made-up construct. I mean, there, just like there was no Latino or Hispanic before the 70s. I asked uh, mm -hmm. one of my students, what were you before 1970? You know, and they can't really answer because this construct is eventually going to crumble because it makes no sense. It expands and contracts, yeah. and eventually we're going to have to deal with one another as individuals, as human beings. As we are, but it is also very ingrained into the fabric of this country, and that is, and that is reality. So you can say... Um, when are we all going to get together in that way? Um, that happens when every single person realizes that they're 
equal to everyone else and the trauma that has been passed down is, is something that we've all collectively worked through. So you, you can't erase history. Okay, gentleman in the back. Hi, good evening. What's oh, your hi, name? Hi, I'm Dr. Howard Ural. Um, hi. Early in your conversation, Ms. Hunter, you mentioned offhandedly, uh, because it's not the major point here, uh, the, something about the need for a new constitution. What do you mean by that? Can you go into any specific about that notion? Yeah, uh, every, every nation from South Africa beyond that has been uh, steeped in this kind of trauma, this kind of oppression, uh, they reimagine a constitution that doesn't see people as three-fifths, that, that doesn't need all of these amendments uh, to abolish slavery, including the 13th. So now several states have had to add, okay, well, but for incarceration, let's remove that because that's still enslavement. Uh, I think it's time for us to have a more perfect union that includes all of us because most of the people in this room would not imagine, including all of the women uh, who could not buy property on their own until the 1970s, forget about the vote uh, in the 1920s for white women. I think that it's a car crash, our Constitution, and it's, it's, it's a document that should be reimagined with the participation of everyone now that this country has become this great melting pot. That's how I feel. So, because uh, we're. We're nimble enough, we can do that, right? We're smart enough to do that. <clears throat> uh, oh. Ron Berenbaum, that's my name. Uh, Hi, Ron. And I'd be interested in both of your opinions when you said about history. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that uh, the AP course in <laughs> Black history has been a subject of uh, considerable discussion in the last few days, uh, and I'd like to hear from uh, both of you on that. Great, great question. I'm going to actually bring in um, Bell Hooks into the conversation, yes, uh, who has been uh, erased from the AP course, as well as ta Coates and Kimberly Crenshaw. <laughs> What is this going to do to young people to not be able to experience the canon of the bell hooks in terms of development as a full human being? It's interesting. Um, I mean, one of the things I noticed, I mean, you mentioned bell hooks and Kimberly Crenshaw, also Angela Davis um, and others. And for me, it, black feminism, like the black feminism, um, you know, f intersectionality. For me, it was really focused on black women, maybe just because that's where I'm at and perhaps it's bigger than that, but that really stood out to me in terms of what was attacked. So I found that interesting because I believe that same feeling that I have about black women, I believe white men also understand what's happening with them too. Mm. And the inverse. And so I believe that's where some of the, uh, the tension in that you know comes in, but in terms of um, in terms of learning about bell hooks and and all of that, it has always been the case that we didn't have that kind of you know curriculum, and so um, it is one of the reasons why I want Black women to continue to push forward because that's the kind of things we can change. You see how he put all his people in all these different places, and so they're entrenched, and then so it's harder to steer course. Um, and so that's why I believe there has to be some sort of strategy around that, you know, to change it. Of course it has an impact. You know, one, I mean, bell hooks for me was very, is like the foundation of the theory in this book. And uh, her idea around, I'm gonna say it in the wrong order, but her idea around that you can't understand a black woman, you actually really can't understand anybody uh, probably today without understanding the existence of imperialism, colonialism, um, patriarchy, capitalism. Am I missing one? Um, I think yeah. I mentioned all of them. And, and how that all works together, those oppressions, those systems, like they're in the water, essentially. They're in the soil. Uh, and so, um, so that's not going to change until we feel like we can change, like really change it and then change it. Right. Well, as you were talking, I was thinking I didn't grow up with, I went to Catholic school. And um, <laughs> uh, my introduction to history was the chapter on slavery, 
and I'm in class and all the white kids are looking at me like, I, like I wasn't in the hold of the ships. And it's the, the picture of black people in car, like cargo. And I wasn't introduced to bell hooks until I was well into my 30s. Uh, I discovered Maya Angelou just because I was an avid reader, but it wasn't assigned. Uh, Richard Wright, same thing. Baldwin, same thing. It was a self discovery And then there's B.B. Moore Campbell, and there's Toni Morrison, and then, then the, the dominoes fall. And it wasn't until I got to college as an English major that I had a black studies professor, and then it was Sula and Blue and all. But, you know, this, this uh, erasure, I think, can be an opportunity as well, because as they ban books, they end up on the bestsellers list. As they <laughs> eliminate people, people are like, who's that? And it awakens curiosity. I think what they're doing actually will backfire personally. So keep, uh, keep doing that. Yes, young lady. Hello, thank you for such a beautiful and rich and thoughtful discussion. Um, I'm Jenny Lane. And uh, speaking of folks who are likely to have been erased from this course, Derek Bell had this idea of interest convergence, which is that black people only advance when they frame their interests as aligned with and in the interest of the majority as well. So I love your idea of black women being empowered to view themselves as abundant. And I'm just wondering, as they push for change, how do you recommend they frame it? Like as interest convergence or an inherent good or something else? Marketing, love it, yes. Well, you know, first, as I stated in the book, it is about that that mindset, and I had this idea that I didn't put in the book, which was, you know, galvanizing, like having these discussions that would happen across the country and sort of figuring out what is important to black women and what are the things that we wanna go after. The, the big thing for me is about um, it being the strategy about how we do that and being very intentional about you know, how we fan that out. I mean, so to me, it's, it's not just, you know, it's not just one approach. So it's not just marching. It's not just being the first one and only. Because um, I'll get excited when it's like the 50th or 100th or whatever, right? That's when I'll get excited. But it's really about like laying out as black women, because I can't speak for all black women because we're not a monolith, but it's laying out what are the three, five, whatever things we want to we want to achieve, and then set a I don't know fifty year plan to get it done. I, I think that it takes real partnership and, and strategy. Yes, this and as you're talking, I'm thinking uh, there would be no white people in the world if black people, black women, did not center humanity meaning that on all of those plantations, there was an opportunity to crush up glass, to poison, yet babies were suckled, people were nourished, people were healed, in spite of the condition of enslavement for centuries, right? And still, still, there's still this kind of desire to see everyone succeed. As I mentioned, Black Lives Matter being formed by black women who were like, this has to stop. They were the ones, not the black men, not anybody else in the streets and you know, whatever the problems people have with the slogan or some of the individuals. And it was an amorph, you know, they, they were all over. It was not one leader, you know, because you know, we can all name leaders. Um, but who's the leader of Hispanic people? Um, who who are the leaders of white people? You know, it's like there are no one, you know, there's not one person that you can point to because you understand that it's it's a collective, and I think black women. Um, if we set an agenda, the world will benefit. And I love that you brought in other countries too with, um, anyway, go ahead and talk about it. Uh. You, know, <laughs> you know, with, you know, with, with this, this notion that we're all together, we're in this together, I feel like if. We are, you know, I, I, I do believe it's easy to, because I'm, I'm blunt, I'm direct. And so I think it's easy to maybe, you know, hear the things that are black, women don't trust white women and, and latch onto all sort of those things. But really, um, fundamentally, I want black women to be seen as human, not as superheroes, not as, you know, we're gonna fix everything, but more that we do have something to offer. And it is true, you know, I, I think about my paternal grandmother, who we call Granny Mama. Uh, she's 93 and lives in Athens, Georgia. And, 
you know, I was saying to her, I can't believe you lived in the South for 93 years. Meanwhile, she had two sons. My dad moved to Connecticut, and my uncle moved to California. So she was essentially, you know, without her boys, as she calls them, my boys. And because she likes Athens, and she's like a pseudo mayor there. Um, but the thing is, is that with everything that she's seen and lived, the fact that she could not vote until her 30s, she has great love and compassion for everybody. I mean, this isn't about just creating a world for black, for black women. It's about that we're dope, and there's a lot we can do. Not that we do everything right, but that, that we need to be fully ingrained into the entire process. Um, and, and we do take care. We do have that legacy where we take care of, not yes. destroy. Yes, and dope, as you point out in the book. I was like, don't tell people what it means. <laughs> Stop giving away all of the things. <laughs> yes. Oh, Miss Elder has a question? A whooping. Oh, oh, no, no, yeah, whooping. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 people of the world, and nobody could put them down. Nobody, from the president to the dog catcher. I don't care what you were. You are special, you are unique, and you can operate that way. We have that perception of yourself, charity, to wrote a book. If people believe that book, I don't know how many people read it. Then they had that perception. It's a perception of who you are. And you think there's nobody like me. It doesn't matter if you're overweight, bald headed, rich or poor. There's no one like you. And you got something to bring to the table. You don't have to count out nobody. Ever. Yeah. Everybody out of breath. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Let's end it on that. Let's Mama end it on spoke. that. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> mother has spoken, and that is it. Or, I, I know there's a reception, because uh, I saw food um, and drink. I think I saw wine as well, for those of you who like to you know, partake in a little of the uh, juice. Uh, and Charity will be here. Oh, thank, thank you.